Okay. We have started recording. Good. Okay. So, uh, till then, in the last seven sessions that we had, we had been doing probability and was saying that was one of the major components when we had to learn a particular model for the data. And we saw that we were able to learn some models for coin tosses and simple statistical tests and so on. With that, we concluded all our discussions on statistics last class. And um, for that is required for either gate or the course or this course, which will deal with the machine learning aspect of it in a few weeks time, in a couple of weeks time. So. In the over the next two or three sessions at max, I'll be before I begin uh, uh, machine learning from session 11 or 10, uh, 10 or 11 roughly, depending on the pace we are going. Uh, what I'll do is I'll briefly introduce to you what is uh, linear algebra required for you to understand machine learning. And uh, since people who have had linear algebra, not had linear algebra. So here, what I'll do is I'll uh, I'll expect that you know class 12 level matrix calculations like multiplication and so on. And I would also expect you know to compute inverses and these type of things that are there in class 12 syllabus. And other than that, everything will be from scratch and we'll see uh, and we'll build up some essential concepts that will be essential for you to understand machine learning. Other than that, we'll I'll, I'll share. So if you uh, forget, there is a comprehensive uh, list of videos that I had done last time. Please go if you have if you wish to go in deeper into it for your exams, you can I'll refer to you to that video series. Uh, there are set of four linear algebra videos that I had done there, and they're much more extensive than what it will be here. Here it will be more of a, uh, it will be more for a practical purposes, and it will be for you to understand what you need to do to how to apply concepts in machine linear algebra to machine learning, and not learn the abstract mathematics behind linear algebra I'll touch upon it and refer to you uh, in the due course uh, which I'll, you must know the playlist I'm talking to but I'll share it anyways in the YouTube videos um, and then you can have a look at those uh, and I think that is that has everything that is there in the syllabus for gate okay uh, so with that uh, let me begin with uh, today's session that is we'll begin with um, linear algebra so uh, We'll start with, uh, we'll do some. So, they, they, I have decided to do it in two parts. One is on, uh, one would be on vector spaces and fundamental subspaces, and the other would be on uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. There would be two major topics, which would be more on the side of projection, projecting your vectors onto some other vectors. So, there are two things I'll be doing. One is understanding these vector spaces and then seeing how we can project to them. But today we'll be mainly with understanding how vector spaces work and how to deal with matrices and vectors. OK, so to first intuit the need for linear algebra, as I did maybe last time, I'll do that again because this is very important to understand and uh, the, in the need. So things like these have were developed in India and China like 2000 years back, uh, if you're like interested in the origin of these and if you are told to solve this pair of linear equations you would what you would do is you would draw two lines right so you would draw lines like these so in any case any point you don't understand these things or you have any doubt to find some errors in my uh, in this uh, please stop me i'll just uh, do this briefly and fast because this is just so One, two, three, four, and five. So what would the first equation be like? It would be a line that would be like if this is x1 and this is x2 on the y-axis, 
I label x1 along the x and x2 along the y. So what would the equation of the first equation be? Like it would look like a line between 2.5 at x2 and 5 at x1. Yes or no? This would be your equation of line or L1. What would be your L2? Your L2 would be x2, x1, x2 is equal to x1 plus 1, right? So it would be something like this. Agreed? Do you have any questions regarding the way I've drawn these lines? I've just used y equal to mx plus c, c being the intercept and m. So we know that the intersection of the lines L1 intersects L2 at P and P is the solution. Solution to this system of equations. So if you want to know the exact value of P, you can see it from the graph. It is X1 is equal to x1 is equal to 1 and x2 is equal to 2, right? This is how you solve linear equations, right? Or you do it by elimination. That is exactly doing the same thing. Find the point of intersection, right? When you have linear equations, you solve it this way. Do you uh, agree or not? Yes. Okay. Uh, so. If you agree, my question being, can we change these linear, these lines into something more general? So what do I mean by that? Can I write this? So to these two equations in form of matrices, particularly vectors. So in numbers, when they are stacked, is called a vector. Why is it called a vector? We'll see in, in due course. So can I write these equations this way? Where I write both equations. So one and one being the components of the first uh, coefficients of x1 and two comma minus one being the co coefficients of x2. So I take x1 common and then I multiply the, the coefficient vector and the of each x1 and x2 and equate that with the, the vector 5 comma 1 on the right hand side. Is this uh, change in notation or uh, abstracting the thing out clear to everyone? So I just wrote the equations in term of two equations stacked in terms of two, num two, ve two numbers in a vector, right? So if you just add these two, it will be x1 plus x2, 2x2 two on the top equal to 5. And similarly, you will get x1 minus x2 equal to minus 1. Is that okay? Okay. So I hope there's no questions. If you have any question, please stop me because the rest of it would depend on understanding this concept. Okay. So this is also equivalent to writing 1 comma 1. 2 comma minus 1 and x1 x2 equal to 5 comma minus 1. And why did I write it this way? I want you to realize that you may have been multiplying vectors and matrices this way. So you may have taken multiply 1 into x1 and 2 into x2 and you add them up to get to set it equal to the first element, right? You would do 1 into x1 plus 2 into x2. Similarly, you would do 1 into x1 and minus 1 into x2. In your school days, you may have used this technique to multiply vectors and matrices, right? But from now onwards, what you'll do is you will take, you will write this as in this form. So x1 times the first column plus 2 into minus 1 times the second column. When you do this, you have that many number of operations lesser for you. So you have, you can write it directly, right? We look. 
that is this gives you so this is just trying to let you understand the notation so x1 and x2 these are the weights for combining the columns so had you had n columns how many now dimensional vector would you need to multiply it with it multiply with it had you had a matrix a m cross n how many so if you want to take combination of the columns how many numbers do you need So you need Chirag says you need n numbers. So each a y a i are a m dimensional m numbers. OK, so uh, others also if you would need n numbers, if you have any questions, please stop me. So to combine the columns, you would need n numbers, and this is what forms the foundation of. Linear algebra. So that is you take combinations of the columns according to the vector that is given to you. OK, so my now my question is, so you're given two vectors, right? You're given three vectors. One is one comma one. And you have uh, two comma minus one. So one one two. And you have five comma minus one. Okay. So which are the or which are the vectors that you have? You have one comma one as your vector. You have two comma minus one as your another vector. And your third vector is five comma minus one, right? Now my question is, you have to take linear combinations of, so they say this is your vector V1, this is your V2, and this is your resultant vector. So you have to weight V1 and V2 in such a way so that the sum becomes, their sum becomes equal to result in the resultant vector. So any questions, how, how any solutions, how you can do that? There any questions? Like graphically, how what do you see over here? What can you do? So this is why they're called vectors, right? So they are they have both a magnitude and the dimension as direction as you studied in physics. So any i cap plus j cap, a i cap plus B J cap that you used to write in physics can be written as A comma B or a vector in this form, right? So which where A and B are the corresponding coordinates for the axis one and axis two respectively. Okay. And people who didn't uh, were having doubts with linear algebra all this while, is this clear? How are you going to use vectors and so on? And uh, my question is how what combinations do I take to, uh, to get these? So I want to get V1 times X1 plus V2 times X2 equal to the resultant vector. So what are the values of X1 and X2 I should choose? Rather, how should I scale these vectors, right? So X1 and X2 are the scaling of these vectors. Make it larger or smaller. What will I do if you are following? I will multiply V2 by two. Yes. So I will multiply V2 by two. So it becomes double the size. Now you use your parallelogram rule and you will get what you need. Right? This is your resultant vector, right? This is your V1. This is your 2V2. So you have V1 plus 2V2 equal to R. So your solutions to X1, comma X2 is nothing but 1, comma 2. OK. So you can choose so all linear equations are nothing but choosing combinations of your. Column vectors, so these are called column vectors because they're columns. 
column vectors of a, of your of coefficient matrix to get resultant right is the motivation for linear algebra clear so and what is and how you combine so if you have a system of equations that you generally solve so i think you have written the system of equations in your school days this way instead of solving x as a inverse b you can sort you can seek to find x as the combinations of columns of a a1 a2 being the columns so you want to com combine the columns with some weights and add them up to get b so people who are new to linear algebra is it clear to you Otrich, is it clear? You said it was not clear beforehand. Uh, yes. If you can get this visual representation in your head, it should be very simple. So if you have, if you can write a coefficient matrix, you can just, what you just need to do is take the combination of the columns to get a vector, your resultant vector. So this is what we'll be discussing theoretically throughout today's class. That is, uh, Dana, can you tell the yeah. generalized case that M cross N1? I will tell everything. This is, uh, this is just one case, right? I'm just trying to motivate the problem. Is the motivation clear? Everything will be done. Those ah, things this is clear. Huh. So your system of equations can be just written as your physics vectors or your vectors like normally you would write in a physics exam or in a physics problem. So linear algebra is nothing but seeing your seeing these vectors and seeing linear combinations of these vectors. That's all. So uh, that was the motivation. But how would you go about doing this? So let us do one simple example. So for two equations, you may be doing it since last seven, eight, removing co co coefficients and eliminating them, right? So but we need an algorithm. So if you have n cross n equations in school, in class 11 and 12, you were taught to do A inverse B. Not even in school, but also your entrance examination told you to do A inverse B to find the values of X, right? You recall that. But that's a very, 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 very bad way of solving this question because A inverse requires, if you recall, computing cofactors and computing determinants, which are exponential time algorithms if you do not do them intelligently. Okay. So today what I'll do is I'll try to motivate how to use the, how to get an algorithm to do it iteratively, right? So let's do that. So we'll try and solve this set of equations and give you an algorithm to understand how do you solve this. So I have an equation. So this set of equations given to me. So what would be your A vector? So if I have to write in terms of AX equal to B, what would be your value of A? What would be a coefficient matrix? Just to see if everybody is on the same page, can you prompt the coefficient matrix and the and the resultant vector you need? Coefficient matrix will be uh, 1, 1, 2, uh, 5, minus 4, 5, uh -huh. minus 5, 1. Good. And B will be 0, 1, minus 3. So, but my question is how the, but the, just solving it manually and removing equations, eliminating them without a pro proper procedure is often tricky. So that you can't write a computer algorithm to do that for you if you do not have, cannot formulate a pro proper algorithm. So that's the for algorithm will for formulate or your Gauss-Jordan elimination, which will be used throughout to understand how to solve for multiple equations and multiple solutions and so on. So uh, look at this equation. So I want to, so whenever you are given this, you could do something like this. So I'll tell you why you can do that, but let us see the procedure first. So one, one, two, five, minus four, five, minus two, five, one. And I augment this matrix with B. This is called your augmented matrix. 
right? Why am I doing it? Because I want to do some row operations on this. So you, you may recall you would like to eliminate X1 from different equations. And exactly that's what we will try and do over here. So we'll try to what the idea is, is trying to set everything that is below the diagonal to zero. Right? If I can set everything below the diagonal and above the diagonal, above the diagonal is not necessary to zero. How will it help me? If if these were zero and this was A, B, C, then your X1 would have been zero, X2 would have been minus one, minus B by four, and X3 would have been minus C by one, right? Or my C by one. Yes or no? So had these been zero, that is one minus four, one, and these were zero, so your x1, x2, x3 equal to b would have just been x1 equal to b1, x2 equal to like x1 is equal to b1, x2 equal to minus 4, x2 equal to b2, and x3 equal to b3, right? Yes or no? If, if every element was 0. So product of the diagonals would just be, isn't it? Yes. So my uh, my question is, can we make the these elements zero? So what I'll what would you do to make all these elements zero? Is the question, right? Any doubt? Any question? Uh, like any ideas? How you can do that? Um, we can multiply the first row by two and then add to the last row. Then the yeah. first digit so becomes zero. You can just, uh, yeah, you can put all of these. So the algorithm is you select the first element. This is called a pivot. You were, why is it called a pivot? Because your elimination would go about the pivot. We'll see why pivots are important, but for now, let us understand the terminology. This is called a pivot. Now, I have to make everything below it zero. So what will I do? I will make row two as row two minus five row one. Yes or no? Similarly, I will write row three as row two as Soshmit was telling me two row one. Right? If I do this, will I get zeros below one? We will, right? So what would your, after this operation, what will this matrix look like? One, zero, zero, because I have made them zero. What would be the second column looking like? One. Yeah, tell me. Tell me. So I am multiplying five One into root. minus nine. Minus nine. Yeah, seven. Seven. Right? Good. So then the third column similarly will be two, uh, two. So five will become five minus two into five, which is 10. So that is minus five, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Similarly, the last row would be four and five. Yes or no? Similarly, yes. zero. Nothing will happen to zero, so I'll keep it same. Yes or no? Good. So you see, this is essentially taking these elements out as you would do normally in a elimination of uh, sub, uh, what is it called? Multiple equations and multiple variables, right? Simultaneous equations. 
is essentially doing that, but in more systematic manner. Now, next step. So first pivot, I have made everything to zero. Remember the objective. You have to make everything below the diagonal to be zero first. So what should be your next step? So once you're done with one column, you move diagonally, right? You move diagonally and select the next element as your pivot. Right? OK, so now what will I do? Once I select this as my pivot, what will I have to do? Minus seven by nine into that minus nine. So no, no, what is the objective I'll do? So that is OK. So I'm writing these steps now. I'll not be writing them in a while because you'll be accustomed to them. But for now, let us write it. Minus seven by nine into R2, right? This is what you will do. Right? Uh, yes. Good. Uh, so what is the objective that I'm doing it for? So yeah. to make the element in the uh, below the diagonal zero. Very good. We will see why it is very important. But for now, just bear with me and think this is true. Minus five. So what would be this value? So it will be five. Let me just calculate it. Five plus thirty five by nine. Is this right? Seven by nine. Uh, Dada, that should be seven by minus nine, I think. Seven by. Ha, huh, I have put minus now. So that is plus uh, minus minus will get become plus, right? Okay, you're saying. Just let me check seven by. So you'll be adding right No, seven by nine into. Yeah, you're right. This will be plus, right? This will be. Plus, correct. Thank you. This will be plus because then you'll get nine seven. Plus seven by nine into minus nine. That is equal to seven minus seven equal to zero. Correct. So what will this term become? This will become five minus seven by nine into five. Yes or no? So forty-five minus thirty-five by nine is equal to ten by nine. Yes or no? Is it okay? Okay. So similarly, what would be B? I hope it is OK for everyone. Similarly, B will be. Minus three plus one into seven by nine. Right, is it? Uh, correct, correct. So this will become. Seven by nine, so twenty four by nine, right? Is it right? Minus three. Minus twenty seven, twenty by nine. Sorry. Is it okay? Yes or no? Is the calculation all right? So now you tell me what will happen. So now you have. So this is called a Gauss elimination. A Gauss elimination. Right? That will be nine. minus 20 by 9. Uh, minus 20 by 9, true. Not 20 by 9, but minus 20 by 9. Correct. Uh, minus 27 plus 7, correct. So this will become minus 20 by 9. Now my question is, now does this help me? 
to get the solution and how does that help me so this is up to this step when you make a lower if you make it an upper triangular matrix so this is called an upper triangular matrix because why is it called an upper triangular matrix because there is no element below the diagonal right this is an upper triangular once you make this an upper triangular matrix i have a use case very nice use case what is the use case can you tell me so we can get z from the last equation last row x3 correct yes so x3 and put in in x cylinder because the rest are zero right 0x1 0x2 and you will get minus 20 by 9 yes or no so you will get x3 directly that is equal to minus 2 yes or no you get x3 now once you get x3 the problem becomes simpler why because in the next previous row you already know x3 right and anything to the left is already zero so you have minus 9 x2 minus 5 into minus 2 equal to 1 yes or no which is equal to how much minus 10 plus 10 minus 9 minus 9 x2 is equal to x2 is equal to 1 right is this clear step 2 from row 2 correct this row now tell me what will be the step 3 to get x1 the step 3 Step three would be uh, x one plus x two plus two x three equals to zero. X two plus two x three equal to zero. But I know all these values, yes or no? X one is equal to minus x two minus two x three, which is equal to I already know x two is one. And x3 is minus 2. Right? This is this is my solution then. So now you have seen that x1, x2, x3 has a solution of 3 minus 1 minus 2. Right? Without even calculating inverses. So inverse here you only had to calculate how many how many numbers. So if you see the complexity of the algorithm, what is the complexity of the algorithm? What is the complexity of this algorithm? If I ask you, so how many operations? So for one pivot, how many operations do you need to be performed? Uh, Chira, it's not exactly n square. Can you can you tell me why? I think it's n no. cube. Because first you will need to find out these factors, right? What factors you will have to multiply? So you, that's one pass. So you found out for one. So for one element, you have n factors. So yeah, it's n square. You are right, but number of operations you will need to do is n cubed. That is that is true. Like you will do a true. So you will see you you will get n numbers, and then you will subtract all those numbers, right? Similarly, for the second column, you would do it for the same. For the second pivot and so on. So you will have n minus 1 eliminations done. Similarly, till 1 elimination. So this is order n square eliminations that you need to do, right? Order n square eliminations, right? But the number of multiplications that you would need to do is order n cube into n for finding out the factors so order n cube multiplications for finding the coefficients that you need to subtract right and then you will be so this this is what you will be 
exactly doing and then uh, but which was much much higher in compared to the case where you had done it for a um, where you had used the determinants and the cofactors to find a inverse so you it's, it's a polynomial time algorithm only much faster and this can be used to calculate inverses it can be used to calculate determinants and so on right so can you tell me why it can be used to calculate determinants so determinant of a if you recall this can directly be used to calculate determinants can you tell me why so if you this would just be if you expand A just product or, of diagonals correct so determinant of any upper triangular element is all zeros right here it is all zero on the lower half so you can expand this across the first pivot you will get this sub matrix again everything is below is zero and so on so you will have just product of diagonals d1 or a11 a Two two dot 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 a n n. So this same polynomial time. This is what your computer does to calculate the product, right? Yes or no? Oh, uh, 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 Chirag, just did you follow why are there n cube operations? Because uh, just to say why there are n cube operations. This is because for every column, you will have to also do that for the rest of the columns, right? That's what I was trying to come at. So for every column, they will, you will have n square operations, yes or no? For every pivot, order n square operations. Just to write this clearly. So for pivot one, pivot one, how many operations will you have? Uh, so you will have n operations into so for making everything zero below the diagonal. How many operations did you need? N operations, yes or no? Uh, yes, a, n into the length that is n plus one. Correct. N plus one is not required. You can just take the orders now. Order. So you needed N operations for the N operations for one column, right? Yes or no? Yes. So how many operations for? So N square operations for N columns. Yes or no? So yes. Number of pivots is equal to. What is the number of pivots? Again, n. So you'll have order n cube number of operations. Is it clear? So if in case you weren't confused what I was saying by calculating the factors and so on, uh, that was the loss of lack of clarity. But now I will not teach you one thing that is the Jordan elimination. So Gauss is up to this. After this is your homework is the Jordan elimination. If you understood elimination, you will do this for me. This is your homework. What is this homework? This homework is I have this Jordan form, right? Gauss form. The Gauss form is given to me. This is my Gauss form. Let me write it in red. The Gauss form. What did we initially set up to do? Like computers would not want to keep do recursions and go back. It's a difficult code. Are you told if you are told to write a program, you would not like to first find X3 and then again write for loops for the previous column, then find X2. This will be sometimes some sort of a dynamic program, right? Once you find X3, you will have to put it in an array, then find X2's coefficient and subtract and so on, right? Once you have already done the elimination, you want the same function to help you do the rest of the elimination so that you can get the answer directly, yes or no? Are you understanding the motivation I'm coming to? Yes. So from that algorithmic point of view, what would help you to do that? From the upper triangular matrix, if I make it a diagonal matrix, will that work? Uh, 
exactly so the idea is eliminating the upper triangle so if i can convert this into this same matrix say let us let me write this as g make g to be diagonal if i can make them to be diagonal do you agree it will just be the augmented part by the value of the diagonal yes or no then you don't need to do all those recursive back back steps yes chirag is saying yes others so if you are able to remove every element on the top let me just write the matrix here for you if you are not following 1 1 2 1 1 2 9 5 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 24 25 26 27 28 29 30 31 32 33 34 35 36 37 38 39 40 41 42 43 44 45 46 47 48 49 50 51 52 53 54 55 56 57 58 59 60 61 62 63 64 65 66 67 68 69 70 71 72 73 74 75 76 77 78 79 80 81 82 83 84 85 86 87 88 89 90 91 92 93 94 95 96 97 98 99 100 right this is what is my matrix that i have ha huh. so uh, my question is as chirag is telling make the upper triangle the diagonal upper part also zero so how will i do this this is called the jordan elimination together gauss and his student jordan made the gauss jordan elimination so he said that why to just remove the lower diagonal i can make the algorithm much more simpler by removing the upper diagonal also it will be the same o n cube algorithm only right so how can you remove the upper diagonal can you help me ashmit like just give me the broad idea and this this you will do as your homework remove the remove you please share it on the teams group yeah ashmit tell me So removing the upper triangle, right? Ha, how will you do that? That's my question. From where will you start? Mm -hmm. So from begin in the beginning we started like this, right? P words. We came like this downwards. We had three P words. Now what will I do? So using the bottom right element, if we can. Correct. Subtract so from the top. Now, or... Yes. Good. So now I will do R two is equal to R two. Minus nine by ten into five R three, right? This will be plus. Yes or no? Correct. If I do forty-five by ten, I'll get five, right? and then this element will go to zero yes or no similarly i will put r1 as r1 minus 9 by 10 into 2 r3 yes or no then this will go to zero understood so but nothing will happen to these columns these columns will stay as it is right no effect on these right and then you can go to 9 and remove one also by 1 by 9 yes or no is every is it clear to everyone or i'll proceed okay let's clear and then you can just divide by the diagonals now my question is we will be trying to understand what happens if the number of equations is more than the unknown now we saw the number of unknowns and the equations were the same and we found a single point of single point of uh, single point solution similarly we will study systematically what happens if more equations are there more unknowns are there and what happens if the same equation is given two times instead of solving uh, other equations so before we do that we have to formalize the entire thing of linear algebra into some mathematical framework 
till now we were only doing computations and doing role removals. But from but now onwards, what I'll do is I'll try to give you the idea of how to come up with these concepts of and the uh, concepts of numbers and vectors and matrices and how to manipulate them. So we'll do what is called a subspace, row reduced echelon form, uh, rank nullity, four fundamental subspaces. And we have already touched upon row reduced echelon form, rank, and the A equal to LU. You will see why. Once you have understood elimination, these three things are already you have understood. I'll tell you why you have. But before getting into all these, to even to understand what happens when you don't have equal number of equations and unknowns, you need to understand the foundations of like at least make abstract uh, um, notations and symbols to help you write things, write proofs, which will help you to solve these questions. So first of all, what so we have seen vectors being vectors being used here and we were taking linear combinations of these vectors to get the resultant vector. So everything that we are dealing with in linear algebras are vectors. They are vectors packed to one with one another, then it's a matrix or they're just single vectors, right? So then we would need to understand what these vectors actually are. Maybe some properties of these vectors and how do they make up spaces, right? So and how we can use these vectors to get other vectors. So what is a vector space is the first question I would like to ask you. So if you recall your class 12 physics, 11 physics, so you recall that a coordinate in 3D, x, y, z, could be written as x, i roof plus y, j roof plus z, k roof. But this roof notation only works because they turn out to be these, these special vectors where they are part of a diagonal matrix, right? So they, they are column by columns of a diagonal matrix. So this X only will have the coordinate in the first first along the X direction. Second vector will only keep it along the second direction. Third will keep it along the third direction. So this is known as what is known as Cartesian space that you have studied all your while. But what happens if these itself, these vectors or the these are also called axis vectors? We'll see the formal name. Axis vectors are vectors are not identical. Not not are not uh, identity vectors. That's it. That is, they are not one at one particular location and zero everywhere else. So then finding a coordinate would have been, would be a bit of a difficult problem to solve. And it, like using X comma Y comma Z would be not that easy, right? As we have seen before, any vector we wrote in terms of when these were not these Cartesian vectors, I, J, K, getting X, Y, Z, you have to solve linear sets of equations. So we'll see why, why is that the case now. So this need not be these I, J, I cap, J cap, K cap, and will there can be any collection of numbers. This is what a vector space means. So highly speaking, it is a collection of objects. I've written by script V over here over a field F. So what is a field? We'll not go into it. Real numbers, complex numbers, modulo, prime numbers, they're called fields. You'll study them in due course. But fields generally have two operations with them. That is, they have multiplication and addition, as in real numbers. That is, you can add two numbers and you still remain in the field. That is, when you add elements of the field, you still remain in the field. You multiply them, you still remain in the field. So you can do normal. So with these operations, you can do normal intuitive algebra. So where you can do normal intuitive algebra of addition and multiplication, that's called a field. Just like vaguely speaking, say real numbers. You can add real numbers, you can subtract them. You will, everything has an additive inverse. 
zero is there in those real numbers and so on. So that is called a field. A vector space V is a subset of n, <coughs> n being an integer, n elements of this field, any n element. So it's a Cartesian product of the field n times. So let us take an example. So if say V is equal to Rn, what will your vector space be? Or if it is R3, for example, what is your vector space? What is an element in a vector? What would be an element? This is a set. So V1, what would be an element in V? How will it look like? X, Y, set. X, A, B, C. Good. Or X1, X2, X3. What would Rn look like? It would look like X1, X2, dot, 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 Rn, Xn, right? So everybody understood what is what is a vector space uh, defined as. It will have properties it must satisfy, but do you understand they have to be collection of n numbers over a field, right? So any n numbers, they can be Cartesian product. If you, you know Cartesian product, that is you select select one element of the set and put it here. Second, so again, this you choose from the set with replacement. That's why I've written R to the power n. So you have every time you have R options, right? Sort of the counting problem. Clear? Yes or no? Okay. So let us take some. So typically you can go over these properties uh, yourself when you're free, but I'll do some of these properties yourself with you. Intuitively speaking, what should happen in a vector space? If you add two vectors, that resultant vector must be in the space. So if this is your space, you have two vectors X and Y, you add them, you would typically want the result of addition to be in the space, right? So everything is governed on this theorem, uh, this idea that the sum of two vectors must be also a vector in the space. So if x comma y is a is are elements in the vector space, x plus y has to be elements in vector space, right? This is called your the first rule or the additive closure. These are propositions. They are they have to hold for a vector space to hold, right? Similarly, there should be a zero. So this is very intuitive definition. So additive identity is a zero. So if you add anything to a zero, that should remain to X. Similarly, you have associative. It doesn't matter how in the order which you add, you have commutative and you have an inverse that should exist. So if X exists, minus X should exist and their sum should be zero. All are very intuitive, yes or no? Is it intuitive? If you have any questions, please ask. No questions? Okay. Similarly, if you have, say, a vector x, multiplying it with, say, scalar numbers, as we saw before, we were multiplying vectors v1 with some scalars alpha 1, right, in this equation. Do you remember? We multiplied the vectors with these scalars, right? So when we multiply yes. elements of the vectors with scalars, they must also be in the belong to the vector space, right? Again, they the rest of the laws come from it. It doesn't matter if you multiply two numbers and the order in which you multiply. Similarly, you have distributive rule. You have two dif two different distributive rules where you can add two numbers and and multiply with a scalar two add two vectors and then multiply with a scalar or add two scalars and then multiply with a vector. They are normal algebraic forms. Similarly, one into a vector should always be that vector. So these are very, very sim simple properties it must hold. And they are like, until you solve one question, you will not appreciate why do we need this property. So let us solve one question. So let's take, so the question is where the vector space V 
is equal to q to the power n. Q is is a set of q is set of all complex numbers. You have to show that q to the power this vec v is a vector space. How will I show? I will show two properties and rest you will do as homework. Rest are simple again. I'll do the most two difficult properties and then you can tell me that do the rest as homework. I'll do this as I'll do this property. This you can these are one liners. These all these are one liners as you can do as homework. Please upload them. And similarly in the second one, I'll do the more difficult one that is this property and this rest you can do as homework. Very simple. I'll, I'm doing the most difficult one. Just tell me what to do. Uh, so first step is to show that X plus Y. Must belong to V if X comma Y belongs to V, right? So first, what do we have to do to show this? So this is additive closure. So these are addition properties, additive properties. I am showing additive closure. What will I do? Take two X and Y randomly, okay? So but each X and Y, do you agree, will be in complex numbers stacked, yes or no? Are you following? So X will be A plus, sorry for the color change. X will be say A plus IB, where A comma B will be RN, yes or no? Similarly, Y will be say C plus ID. Just to represent their vectors, I'm putting hat on them, okay? Yes or no? Any questions? So you see X can be written as A1 plus IB1, A2 plus IB2, dot, 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 AN plus IBN. So this is a, this belongs to QN or not? Clear? Others clear? Other than Chira? Yes. Okay, so now if it is clear, tell me what will I do? How will I show that X plus Y belongs to this? Uh, belongs to the vector space. Tell me, Uttarish. Uh, we will add. add. Okay, and, we will add. X plus Y, what will hmm? Tell. And we, we know? know that real paths get added up and complex imaginary paths get added up separately. Good. So I can add A cap plus C cap and I B cap plus D cap. Right? Uh, and to we now this a cap plus c cap will give another r power r n. Good. E cap and f cap are r power n, and therefore x plus y is also in v. Very good. So you since you have the rest of it, rest of it you can do right. Similarly, like adding zero, you will just get zero. Right, like x right. Zero is still zero in your uh, complex numbers. It's still the Zero, zero number. You can add it zero to anything, and you can still remain the same. And these, this is just trivially true because complex numbers are commutative. Yes or no? Adding, 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 and adding in addition of complex numbers is commutative and associative. Yes or no? So by yes. trivial, tri by triviality, if A holds, C and D will also hold. Similarly, E will also hold. Let us do the next, the distributive rule. From the multiplication, from the multiplication property. Do I have space on top? No, I don't have. Okay. Just let us do, I'll just take some space here and just write it small. Okay. Multiplicative rule. Right. The question is x is equal to. So again, I'm writing A plus IB. Right. And I'm going to write 
alpha plus beta into x. So alpha and beta, what will be alpha and beta? Where do we have to belong? If you are following, they are oh, scalars. So cute. yeah, very good, very good. They are scalars. So they should belong to the field in which you define them. Good. Very happy. So what will be alpha plus beta into x? For complex numbers, our distributed property, do distributed property hold for complex numbers? Distributive property of complex numbers? Yes or no? So from the distributed property of complex numbers, they will it will hold. Because X is less, let us just show that. Let us show, show for one. So say X is A I A1 plus I B1, A2 plus I B2, dot 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 A I A N plus I B N. So say alpha is alpha one plus I alpha 2 right i am showing that alpha into x is belong to v then it will be like simple so what will each element be the ith element be ith element will be ai plus ibi into alpha 1 plus i alpha 2 what will this be a1 a i alpha one plus minus b one alpha two plus i into a one alpha two plus b one b i alpha one. Yes or no? Right? There again reals say r one and r two. Right. R and let us write this J. Yes or no? Is this clear? So all I did is I showed that the product of so if X is a complex number, alpha is a is a is a X is an element in the vector space. Alpha is a complex number. Alpha X is also belongs to the vector space. So if I can show that, I can also use to, to show that from the property of complex numbers, that complex numbers can be distributive. So I can just distribute them into alpha x plus beta x, right? Any questions? And then I'll go into the real crux of the of today's class. That is once we have understood what is what are these uh, vector spaces, that is their collection of numbers where they can be added and they still remain in the set, we can now come to the real part of the discussion that is what is the subspace see vector space generally for us so i just wanted you to not be in the dark this is not generally in your syllabus but vector space you will deal with is normally rn or sometimes it can be complex number n numbers which, which you can deal with normal calculations you can do so you can always think of either rn or cn as your vector space and you can get elements n numbers from the real numbers n numbers from complex numbers in machine learning you'll just be using n real numbers most of the times right that would be a vector space but generally all the n dimensions that you're using may not be may not have information given to you so you may not have information about all the rn given to you for example say you have a 3d 3d space this is rn r3 do you recall the equation? Say you have an equation of a line in 3D. X by A equal to Y by B equal to Z by C. Right? It passes through the origin. What is the dimension of this uh, line? What is the dimension of a line? But I'm not come to dimensions generally. But I'll just want you to understand the intuition. 
So why do we need a subspace? Vector space we understood is the entire space. Vector space is the entire space given to us. Given. But subspace is, is what you will deal with generally. That is, all your data points may lie only on this line. So what is this subspace? What is the dimension of this subspace? Is it R3? No, it is 2D. So we'll try to understand what is the dimension of this subspace and how to characterize it. So are you following or is there any questions? Please ask. Am I audible? I think I think I've, I was disconnected, right? No, you are audible. OK, so OK. So then uh, did you understand the question? So if even in a 3D space in your room, if I have a line, what would be the dimension of that line? Like, like we can proceed in two directions. So it can be 2D. Point is 1D and a line is 2D. Point is 0D, right? Point is zero D. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, yes. Line is one, one direction. D. One direction, yes. Yeah. So this is the broad intuition of this is why I was telling how many dimensions. So you see your space, your vector space can be 3D. Vector space can be 3D. But you can live In a lower dimension. You understood the intuition? So that is why we need to study what is a subspace. A subspace is defined as a defined as a lower dimension in the vector space, which must have two properties. So it must have two properties. A vector space must hold always. What are the two properties? Can you tell me? Like without seeing the answer is written here, but if you can see the answer and tell me why it should have that property, I would be happy. So any linear combination combination of elements in a subspace stays in the subspace. Is it clear? Is it is the intuition clear? So why am I doing this? So if you remember that matrix that we had and we took the linear combination of its columns. So the columns were in a particular subspace. When I was taking the linear combination of those subspaces, I wanted the resultant to be in that space only. And we'll see why. Right? So that we can make a sort of a subspace with these vectors itself. We come to it. So is the definition clear for the subspace? And we'll do one question, a few questions, and we'll be clear why it is necessary. The intuition will be clear as well. The definition clear? That any linear combination of elements in the subspace, so you see here, so X and Y belongs to the subspace. There are some of them must belong to the subspace. And also, if you multiply F with an element in the field, that is any scalar, that must also belong to the subspace. In other words, any linear combination of X and Y must belong to the subspace. Is it okay? You can either show these two or show this. They are equivalent, right? Please ask questions if you don't understand the definition. The two elements you have in the subspace. So if this is your vector space V, a subspace is a subset of the vector space, but still your elements, if you add them up, X comma Y, alpha X comma beta Y, and you add them, Z will also be in the subspace. This is the diagrammatic representation. Okay. X, alpha, Y, beta, I will add them. Z will also belong to the same subspace. Okay. Good, Othrich. And others also, I hope it is clear. 
So now I will ask you if you have understood. Let's do a few questions and see why it is important. Say the vector space is R2. Let us draw R2. V is given to us as R2. And you are asked. Which of these are subspaces in this vector space? Y equal to MX plus C. Where C is not equal to 0. So this is a line that you will have. Without loss of generality, this is y equal to mx plus c, right? This is question one. Is this a subspace? Please, this is where you should interact, and then it will become very clear. What are the elements in the subspace? Give me an element in the subspace. If it was a subspace, at least this set. Give me this is a, a line is also a set, right? Give me an element in this set. How will you define this line as a in form of a set? X comma y such that y equal to mx plus c. Zero comma c. And s x is r. Zero comma c. So this is an element in the set. Similarly, another element in the set is say x naught and mx naught plus c. Yes or no? Right. So these are elements in the set. Now I am telling if so, the, these are two vectors, yes or no? You gave me two vectors, I chose your vectors only. Correct. Now, linear combinations of these vectors, do they all belong to this line? Is my question. If, you, if they do not, then it is not a vector space. If they do, then it's a vector space. Uh, All of them don't belong. Yeah, you tell me. I, uh, Oshmita, I, I have heard your answer. I'll... Yes, if we add these both points, uh -huh. then we will uh -huh. get another y value for the same x naught. So that clearly shows that it does Very not good. lie on the line. So if you are adding 0, comma c, this is how you should do mx naught plus c. So you'll get, I also never thought of doing this good thanks both of you have given me a new way to disprove it good very nice so if i this is for the same x naught you get one more point over here right so this does not belong to the the set l1 therefore y equal to mx plus c is not a vector space or not a subspace vector space also it will not be but it's not a subspace as well Right. Good. So you're seeing why is the subspace important? Because when I'm doing so in reality, what you will be left with is you will be given a set of vectors. And you will have to fill this space. If you have to fill this space, you will take linear combinations of these vectors, right? And then fill the space. But I'll tell you what I mean by filling the space. But any linear combination of the vectors would fill the space. And what would actually happen is if you if they go out of the set, then you are not left with a proper definition, right? So if you uh, say you have n vectors and you they fill a particular plane, and if one of them, if you keep take linear combinations, goes up to the line to the uh, like uh, height of the room, say to take two vectors along the floor of the room. Um, along the floor one and two. So say x axis and y axis. So you take any linear combination of the x axis and the y axis. They span R2, right? The span R2 matlab, I mean any x, y can be represented in form of an x axis coordinate and the y axis coordinate, right? As I had shown. Yes or no? Yes. So uh, in that case, you will see is this will become a subspace because any element you take, it still remain in R2. But this line will not, and that was the reason why. So if it is a sub, if it is in the subspace, it will help you solve equations that we had done, right? So we, if we, the idea is the linear combination of these vectors 
will belong to the subspace s if ai belong to the subspace so your solution vector on all we'll see in a while should also belong to the subspace and there you will get better properties that is the reason of selecting subspace in this way okay don't worry about what i said just now just uh, go just see the next question so question 2 is y is equal to mx will this be a subspace Uh, yes. Yes. So it will be a subspace. Why? Chidak says yes. Otrit says yes. Why? Because we can take two points. Okay. Mm -hmm. X1, Y1, X2, Y2. They satisfy Y1 equals to YI equals to M, XI. Good. Then take a alpha and beta. You don't even need to do that. Geometrically also you can show. Good. That is also you can do. But Say two vectors if you have, if they are parallel or anti parallel, they will always add up to the same direction, yes or no? They will add up either in the same direction along that same axis, right? So if you have vector V1 and you have vector V2, this is essentially nothing but subtracting, and this will be your V1 minus V2, right? And this will have to be along this axis. As you are telling me, a point here. Mx naught, x naught comma mx naught, and x one comma mx one. If you just add them up, you will get x zero plus x one, and m of x zero plus x one, which is also belonging to this subspace. Good. Now my question three is x greater than zero and y greater than zero. That is the first quadrant. Is this a vector space? And question four is x greater than zero, y greater than zero, and x comma y greater than zero. That is the first and the fourth quadrant. Uh, first and the third quadrant. Either, are either of them a vector space? So let's take the first example, this one. Is this a vector space? Say, let us take X, right? So what is the field over which it is defined? So your vector, your field is R squared. So your vector space is R squared. Your subspace is defined. This is your subspace. So what is the field defined? It's defined by R, right? Right? So any linear com anything that you will do, say three is a vector space, four is not. So why do you think uh, Chirag that three is a vector space? So I'll take one example. See, if I just take minus x, right? Minus x does not belong to the subspace. Let us write this as three. So it is not right. It is not a subspace. So any scalar multiplication must also belong to the subspace we have seen. Yes or no? According to the properties, any scalar multiplication or addition of two vectors must be in the subspace. So I multiplied minus one, should have been in the subspace. It is not. Is it clear to everyone? So S3 is not a is not a vector space, right? Or not a subspace. Any doubts? Any queries? I think you have some queries, right? No queries. Okay. Is it okay, Chira? So why is it not a subspace? Hey, uh, yeah, Chirag only said, no, it's a subspace. I hope uh, Chirag, it is clear, right? Similarly, say if I take X1 and X2, I think this is why Chirag told me that it is not a subspace. 
because there's some can be in this. Okay. Similarly, you can always use this uh, these type of questions. You can draw them vectorized vectorially and take the such trivial counter examples and disprove not a subspace. So what did we observe to be a subspace? What has to happen? It has to be a lower dimensional space passing through the origin to be a subspace. It has to be to be lower dimensional sp dimensional space containing origin. So now if I ask you, what are the subspaces? What are the subspaces type of subspaces R3 contains? What will you say? Can you give me a general set of equations that of all subsets in R3? S plus B y plus C equal to zero. Very good. What is that, Brahmojit? Okay, you have told me. Don't tell me. Don't, don't tell me. Don't tell me. I'll ask someone else. He has told me one equation: ax plus by plus cz equal to zero, where a comma b comma c is not equal to zero. Okay. So what is this equation of other plane? Plane. Plane. Good. So plane passing through the origin is the right answer that Chirag gave me. So the origin, as we see, must be contained. Now you see Oshmit uh, and Othridge, you can just put any values of x, comma, y, comma, z, and we'll still be on this plane, right? Because on this plane, if you take on a plane itself, if you on a plane itself, if you have two vectors, the play vectors always add up in the same plane. Vector addition is planar, right? Vector addition is planar, right? So it's a subspace. So this is one set of equations I got. The trivial one is R to the power three itself is a subspace of R to the power three. Yes or no? What is the other subspace? I have already given to you. X by A equal to Y by B equal to Z by C. Yes or no? Equation, all equations of lines through the origin. Yes or no? Yes. And third is just the zero vector. So any Rn can contain Rn minus one, Rn minus two, dot dot dot, zero dimensional subspace, right? And these are dimensions. These are called dimensions. We'll see why formally what are dimensions, but the power that it's raised to is called the dimension. So all subspaces can be contained in Rn, right? Just you need to recall that the origin must be present in that space, subspace, and it must be plane. It must be a plane, right? Two things to remember, must be a plane, and must contain the origin. And for me, a plane also is a line. Line is also a plane. 2D plane is also a plane. 3D plane is also a plane. So a 3D plane can be contained in a 4D space, something like that. So think of any dimensional planes as planes. If it is 100 dimensional data, you can still think of it as an abstract plane. Must contain origin. That is the difference between mathematics and physical sciences. In mathematics, you have to be abstract. Yeah, how about you tell me? Because then equation AX plus B plus CZ, if ah. we allow A, B, C to be zero also, so that we can sum up the entire subspace of R cube in that one equation only. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're saying, yeah, yeah. If you take, I just wanted to show, if you want to show A, B, C to be zero, either A and B to be, uh, either A, B and C to be equal to one and so on. And then you can take, but you will not get lines, right? Lines along 3D you will not get. They would, like if A is zero and B and C are not zero. But they, you will get it along only x, y, y, z, and z, x plane, not in some arbitrary plane, right? Getting lines would be difficult, right? In arbitrary plane, you would not get. You would get only x, y, y, z, and z, x plane. Okay. Good observation, though. 
but now why am i so much uh, concerned about these subspaces and all these things why why do uh, you even bother can, yeah can you explain that your concept of clean like 100 dimensional okay. that thing i couldn't yeah, understand yeah. i'll explain so but you understood r2 right r2 planes in r3 and so on no r2 plane i couldn't means just a plane i can understand no but, plane is in r2 only plane is a surface right uh, yes yes that is okay ha ah, that's what i'm saying r2 plane in r3 you understood that passing through the origin hmm that i have understood in r3 all the cases you have understood i'll come to why it is required uh, say this is the example right we were doing this example recall where was the example ha ah. let us take this example and then i will come to the right we'll write it at the end probably so this is what this was a set of your equations that we were dealing with so your a matrix was 1 1 2 5 minus 4 5 i'm trying to bridge everything here please pay attention 1 and your b matrix was 0 1 3 right what were you trying to do we were trying to do x1 times 5 minus 2 let us write these vectors as v1 v2 v3 right as i taught you always write in terms of column vectors right you have grasped that concept right trying to write in terms of column vectors so i can write v1 x1 plus v2 x2 plus v3 x3 equal to b yes or no what is understood yes so if it, so do you agree that they are three different vectors 1 2 and three vectors let me draw it in a plane it will be easier for you say i represent this r3 as a plane abstractly so it's it's a it's a room but i am seeing in some say from r4 but it looks like r3 for the time being you think that this is r3 that is that is these three vectors are independent that is you cannot express one vector in terms of the other i'll come to what is independence as well right let us not for think about independence for the timing so these are the vectors right yes or no three vectors you have yes what is the objective the objective is to think abstractly like this is to find b right why i am worried about vector spaces you are understanding now see if it is a subspace b must be in the subspace of of a do you agree to have a solution to have a solution why if i ask you why why you what will you tell me why do you does it have to be in a subspace because any can be linear combination generates very good all the all linear combinations linear combinations so this this is a subspace spanned by v1 i'll come to span so i'm slowly introducing spans v1 v2 v3 so it's the say this plane is being spanned by v1 v2 v3 so all linear combination exist in s1 2 3 let us write this as s1 2 3 right thus to get a solution in form of x1 v2 x2 and v3 x3 equal to b b must be in must be in s1 s2 s3 so this has solved one problem i had thank you for asking this question i will not come back to it later so for any system of equations the target variable or the or this target that you have that you vector that is b must be in the subspace of the column columns right must be in the subspace generated by the columns do you agree what does this mean 
I'll come to now. But let us take up what you were you were asking is an, a hundred dimensional plane, right? What does you understood this, right? For solutions, they must be in the subspace, and linear combinations is making a plane. Just like in 2D, let's take two vectors in 2D. If I take A and B as two vectors, do you agree any vector in this 2D can be made in terms of alpha A plus beta B? Any vectors? For any vector, you can always find an alpha and a beta, right or wrong? Yes. So, so do you agree this R2 is spanned by spanned by A comma B? Spanning means the linear combinations of these vectors is making a subspace. Spanning means good that I'm that is this is connecting to the next phase of the talk. Spanning means linear combination set of linear combination of the vectors. Right? All linear so it's a set of so if I tell you to write now, if I tell you to write a hundred dimensional phase plane, what will you write? We'll come to for the time being, let's take their independent vectors. Do you agree that X1, X2, X100 is a vector in Rn, R100? This is a hundred dimensional vector? Yes. Now, say, if I have 100 of these 100 dimensional vectors, trivially 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, they are the trivial vectors, right? Yes or no? They can span the entire R100. Yes. So EI, where the ith element is 1, ith element, i equal to 1 to 100 are the trivial are trivial vectors, trivial vectors that span R100, right? Or no, don't write trivial, are Cartesian vectors, right? We see slowly we are extending what we learned in R2 and R3 to higher, higher spaces. Good. So now your vector space here, say if you have say 100 of these vectors, is this space containing so linear combinations of this is say a v nu v101 so any v101 we'll see also can be written as summation of alpha i eis right i equal to 1 to 100 correct or wrong uh, yes so this this is now any vector so once it's any vector so it's a Continuous space, yes or no? So this is what I mean by a plane in 100D. Understood? This is why I gave the intuition of a solution of a system of equations where you had R3, but the R3 was being you, you wanted to vector in particular in R3 and you were taking linear combinations of other vectors in R3, which could give that, right? In R100 also, it's a similarly a plane having independent vectors. It's not flat. It will be some very, very high dimensional hypercube, but you can still think it as a plane and all the properties will hold, right? Yes. Good. This is how anytime you are given a vector, just draw planes and you will get answers. Okay. So today I'll do something, two things before I go to uh, next day, we'll start with fundamental subspaces, but uh, I'm going slow. Please follow. So what is a span? So uh, Uttarish, now I defined a span just now. But so do you, do you can you help me write that? What is a span? I have already written it, but can you like tell me? Say if you have a set of vectors, k vectors, k vector that I drew. So let me draw this. Right. So you have k vectors. What would be a span? The v1, v2, dot 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 vk. Span of V, how will it look? Yeah, tell me. Can you help me? 
means if v i is v i is form a subspace, then we will get all possible See, vectors. If it is v i's are single vectors, right? They are one one vectors. You have selected say one zero 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 one zero and so on. They are not. They are not. They are. They are. This is a countable set, right? This is a fixed, not even countable. This is a uh, finitely countable set. Yes or no? Uh, K yes. vectors are there. So it is not. Uh, so they they are discrete. K discrete vectors, but I want to find a plane that these vectors make. So this is called a spanning set. A spanning set is the plane that these vectors make. Plane that linear combination of the vectors make. This is the intuition. So mathematically, how will you write the plane? So let us write S V as the plane. This is alpha i v i. I equal to one to n or k here, such that alpha is belong to the the field that we are defining it for. Yes or no? So they are just the linear combination. So the set is elements all linear combinations of these vectors, right? Yes. That would give me, for example. Oh, I already have examples for you. Nice. And then I'll show it's a vector subspace. Good. So I this mathematical set set notation is clear. Yeah, Brahmaji, tell me. You said that the span is a countably finite set. Spanning set is a countable set. So this is a span is an uncountable set. It has infinite real numbers, right? It, it is countably infinite. The span. Non-countably because it's real numbers. Real numbers are uncountable. Un 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 uncountably infinite. Yeah, this the is the spanning set. Spanning set is a count finite countable set. Yeah. Spanning set can be accountable, can be car, but they, they are generally uh, countable. Can be finite or infinite. We'll see why it is why it is countable because once you have n vectors, after that, anyways, you get redundancy. We'll come to that independence. But so this is a spanning set, and this is the spanning space spanned by the space space spanned by the band. By the set, so it's essentially. If I tell you what is the spanning set of a matrix, what will you say? What will you tell me? What will you say? Just now I explain. First example is spanning set of a mat spanning space spanned by a matrix. What will it be? Typically, when you multiply a something like this, what will it be? What are the spanning uh, vectors then? Yeah, tell. Like we will multiply x and y. And y? Uh, no, no, no. Y is where is y? So say you have n columns. What is the sp space spanned by this matrix then? So these are the columns are the vectors, right? Each are vectors. So uh, yes. any alpha i or let us write x i a i belongs to the spanning set of a. Like it's a space spanned by a. Yes or no? Therefore, the vector matrix multiplication belongs to the span of a, right? Just now I showed that. So if you multiply a vector with a matrix, this must be in the span of the. This is also called as a column space. Column space. You understand the definition? The linear combination of the columns, space of all linear combination of columns, right? Is it okay? Okay. So tell me V1 and V2. What is the space spanned by V1? Will 2 is formally also, but just for your intuition, what is the space spanned by V1? 
what is s of v1 can you tell me so for finding s of v1 what will i have to do are you not following for finding s of v1 so these are the these are the spanning vectors right spanning vectors so what is the space spanned by the spanning vectors a line yeah it will be a line but how to write it it will be alpha times 1 comma 2 plus beta times 2 comma 4 yes or no yes, means that matrix form will come again so matrix form you can write in matrix form or not write in matrix form it's a linear so you i think it was there in your class 12 also say you remember right so if you had independent vectors in your vector uh, so in then one vector is independent if it is not a linear combination of the other something like that was there right you cannot you cannot write in form of in yeah so but then now here you are just writing the linear combinations it comes from that logic only ax equal to you are using ax what is chira yeah we can take common and 2 be out very good so where alpha comma beta will belong to r r is the space we are assuming for the time being so he is telling me so alpha plus 2 beta right into 1 comma 2 yes or no so this is this can be equal to some delta so instead of writing alpha comma beta i can just write delta so what is the space span so as v1 is delta into 1 comma 2 right so if i write x1 and x2 1 2 so this is the vector space of right sv1 okay. yes good now i have a second question for you say i have 1 2 4 5 and 6 8 what would be the space that it spans and you have to show me that and will that will lead me to something that is called yeah tell me what will this span first tell me how will i write the spanning set as v2 will be like alpha 1 2 beta alpha 4, 1 2 okay alpha 2 4 5 and alpha 3 6 8 right yes or no all linear yes. combinations now i will not do any solution you have to tell me how, what will it span i will not like simplify this any further yeah 2d space 2d space r2 he is telling me s2 is equal to r2 why is this true because we have these vectors 1 2 4 5 6 8 and yeah. even if if i take any of these two vectors they are non overlapping and in a two to this space non overlapping vectors will be mean basis of vectors that can span Good. the entire space so so 1 2 uh, that is true 1 2 and 4 and 4 and 5 uh half 4 by 5 so these two are non overlapping so you see they can linear combination 
can generate all vectors. For example, 6, 8, you can just write as alpha 1, 1, 2 plus alpha 2, 4, 5. Yes or no? This is just a 2D, two simultaneous linear equations. Yes or no? And you will get 6, 8. Correct. You, there is an alpha and beta that solves it, alpha 1 and alpha 2. There exists alpha 1, comma alpha 2. Yes or no? Since then, correct. So, O3, uh, like since people who are following, can you tell me? So, if, if V contains VI in V, which is R to the power N, so the spanning set can be at max, spans the dimension of the spanning set of V can be at max, how much? N. Clear or Rothrich? Why the dimension can at most be N? Uh, yes. See, see, till now I have not even formally defined dimensions, but you know dimensions from the time you were born because you are in a 3D, you see papers which is 2D, you have pens that are 2, 1D, you have dots, that if point masses, you deal in physics that are 0D and so on, right? So at most, so now my question is, so I'll do a formal question first and then I'll go to the question that I have. Keep this in mind. What is the condition? What is the condition for V to span Rn if Vi belongs to Rn. Keep this question in mind. In the meantime, let us do one question that I had uh, thought about, thought for you. That is, show that the span of a set, span of V, is a subspace, or a vector space, subspace. Vector space that will always be. Say span of V is a subspace. Okay. So the question is span of V is a subspace. Say V is equal to V1, V2, dot, 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 VK. So you have K vectors and you are saying so you have to show that span of V is a subspace. How will you show? You have to show that. Show that this is a subspace. How will you show that? Like we can take. Yeah, first, uh, first, Brahm Mohit and Mohit. Tell. The space I am in is of greater than k dimension. Then I no, mean, no then need of no need of any case here because span can have. Uh, redundant vectors also, so it doesn't matter. That's what I'm saying that if you have greater than k dimensions, then you anyways have a plane, and if less, true, then these are redundant vectors. So no, but that is true. But you have to show that formally. You have to show formally. That is that is intuitively true. But then you have to show mathematically also. What three you go ahead? Yes, like any vector in the span set can be written as alpha 1, v1 in this form. Very good, very good. I think uh, Chirag also says something like this. Take LC and satisfy properties of subspace. Okay, LC as a linear, linear combination. Understood, understood. Ah, now, what did you tell me in details? I think he is also in the right path. You are also in the right path. Any vector in the... Tell me. Ah. We can take any factor, say S equals to alpha 1, uh, summation alpha I, VI. Okay, I let me write V1 as one vector, and it belongs to two vectors I'm taking, V1, comma V2 in spanning set of V. Right? This is what you are, not V1. Uh, You're right, S1, comma S2 is okay. Huh. Yes, then? now now we can take alpha S1 plus beta S2, and Good. this will Good. also belong to span of V, because if, while taking the linear combination, 
if we consider alpha, uh, we, if we multiply alpha and plus beta with alpha uh, with those individual components because they also belong to the field. Uh, Very good. So, in the, not field, the, the subspace. Field is alpha and beta. Ah, yes, Al yes, yes. Alpha comma beta belongs to the field. So S1 can be written as some, so give me another term, AI comma VI. AI into VI, VIs are vectors, these are scalars, right? Linear combinations, I equal to 1 to K. Okay, Brahmojit? Yes, and similarly, I can write 1 to K, VI, VI, right? I hope it is clear. So now I will just put this in this equation as O3 is telling me. So I'll get summation of I equal to 1 to K AI alpha plus BI beta into VI. Yes or no? Let us write this as some delta I VI. I equal to 1 to K, which is also in the subspan of V. Yes or no? Uh, yes. This one. Yeah. So what have we shown here? We have shown that if S1 comma S2 belong to the span, so alpha comma bit one, so therefore span of V is a subspace. Good. Now I want you to remember this property. So what is the condition for V to span entire Rn or any particular space that you have? So for Rn, what is the condition that you need? If I give you n plus two vectors, are you always guaranteed to have uh, not randomly though? But I'm, if I if I select n plus two vectors for you and tell to span R n, will it always span R n? Will I if I give give n plus two vectors to you? Is it guaranteed to span Rn is my question. No. Chirag says no, Brahmuji says no. Any reason for that? No. What is you, your answer? Yes, no. Why? Because if we take uh, three vectors lying in a line. Ah, true. Uh, and uh, Brahmojit, your answer? Same. Uh, we need only three of them, of these vectors to be linearly dependent. Then. Correct. So. so if less than, than n vectors are related to one another. And what is this relation? We'll see one another then no as everyone is saying okay but then for that we need n independent vectors and to understand what is independent let us understand what is basis so basis of a spanning set is the minimal subset of the set so the minimal subset that spans the a particular space is called a spanning set. Keep that question in mind. We'll also get back to that. But, but clearly, we are trying to move redundant vectors away. So for example, let us take the example. We'll do the proof there. Example, say, as we saw, so I told you what is the spanning set of V1 and V2. So V1 was minimal spanning set, you have to tell. 1 comma 2 and 2 comma 4. What would be the basis of basis of span of V1? Any, yeah. 
Is it clear to everybody? Because two comma four is some it can be obtained from one comma two only by just multiplying two, right? So if alpha i v i is equal to zero, then and alpha is not equal to zero for all i, you can remove one vector, right? And iteratively remove it. Iteratively remove until you get k independent vectors, right? Unless alpha i v i equal to zero if and only if alpha i equal to zero. Okay, so if I ask you this question, how many basis vectors does span of v1 have? What will you say? And to avoid confusion, let us write the span of V1 infinite. to be S1. Who said infinite? Brombuji. You said. No, no, I would. Who said? I would like to ask you the reason. Are you? I'm an audible. You're right. Tell me the reason. Hello. Infinite because one comma two or two comma four, half comma one, all are basis vectors, right? Any so this line, any vector along this line will be a basis vector and can be used to represent all other vectors, right? Am I audible? Uh, yes. Okay. So for V2, what will be the basis vectors? How can I convert this spanning set to a basis 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 set? Take any two. Correct. I can just remove the last one because we saw that. Well, that can be a solution sum of other two, right? So I just remove that. Good. So this is the minimal set. So I will. Uh, I have asked a few questions. So now that brings us to the definition of a dimension. A dimension of a space is the number of basis vectors that can be used to make it. Right? Number of basis vectors is the dimension of that space. Right? I would like you to think about this, why it is true even intuitively. Take your, see your room to take one line along the wall, another line perpendicular to it. You will see two lines are enough to have the entire floor mapped out. Another vector you take it is enough to map the three floors. OK, so two, I will start from next day from this proof. And we'll maybe we'll be able to. We'll only be able to complete this and begin. A part of the next class. But uh, let us end with these two properties. Let us select these. Uh, The properties let us finish and then we'll stop. So the properties are remember a basis set B is a Basis set spans S. Okay, let me write it properly. 
let bx span or let me write bv span the space v and then bv where say v1 v2 vk must have the following properties that is say if you had initially a capital v something like that let me write bv over here and v tilde previously v tilde as v1 v2 dot 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 vn it must have these properties that the span of bv should be equal to the space v right so instead of writing so initially i was given to you i had given you n vectors but you saw only k were necessary right so you would say that the span of this basis vectors is same as the span of the old set of n vectors the rest n minus k min n minus k vectors were all dependent and that is equal to the space v second property is elements of v are independent right these two properties so if you are told something is a basis what will you have to show so if i ask you if asked say bx is a basis of space of subspace s what are the properties it must hold anyone if i ask you bx spans a subspace s what should be the properties we'll use this extensively next class that's why i'm just reiterating any linear combination gives a uh, element of subspaces so what is that so you will get the span of vx is equal to s yes or no ah uh, yes this is one second is vx must have independent elements right that is alpha i vi i equal to 1 to k is equal to 0 if and only if alpha i is equal to 0 for all i right there is no for example 1 0 and 0 1 can you make 0 by adding any linear combination of these two axes you can't right can you multiply these two vectors and get zero vector and take linear combinations of these two vectors and get zero vector you cannot no no in the 2d space we can yeah you will get to 2d right so you you will need to be that them to be collinear to be zero right is it clear any doubts others okay so first thing how will you show that span of bv is equal to v till is equal to v how will you show this very simple simple argument will do both these properties are by construction right by construction that is yes, v the, yeah tell me so make this set have these properties right if they are redundant vectors yes. we can exclude them yes so b v must span v v excluded redundant vectors only vectors only that is which were dependent and how to do that we'll see in the next class
in four fundamental subspaces. For the time being, let us think that we have removed the redundant vectors. That is dependent vectors, which were dependent. Similarly, the elements have to be independent. That is also by property alpha i v i is equal to zero is the stopping criteria. Selecting the minimal subspace guarantees independence, therefore. So therefore, you cannot get any other elements in that space once you have selected the minimum subspace, right? So you can also prove this by contradiction. How can you prove that by contradiction? Say if they are not independent, one line contradiction proof. Can you tell me? Alpha I say not independent. Say they are not independent. What will you do? If they're not independent, what can you write? Othrich or any other, anyone else? Then the, then the coefficients, then for non-zero coefficients, we can sum the vectors to be zero. There exists alpha i not equal to zero such that summation of alpha i vi equal to zero, right? But then that contradicts the construction in two by definition of minimal set, right? Correct? Yes or no? Construction in two means? Uh. Construction two, the property two in construction, that is, they must be independent elements. We will stop only when they're independent, right? So if you have to span R2, we will require two independent vectors, right? And stop removing once you have two independent vectors. So if we have dependent vectors, we are saying, say we have dependent vectors, then we'll have this condition, yes or no? I equal to one to K? Yes. And that implies that you're contradicting the second property, which is that they have to be independent as you just removed all the dependent vectors, yes or no? Uh, yes. So the basis vector must have independent vectors and it must span the entire space. Okay. Good. So should we stop here or? And in that same question, what would be the, what would be the dimension of the space? Dimension of V. What will be dimension uh, key, of V? Key, key here. Okay, let us stop the here and I'll leave you to digest these theorems. And uh, next day I'll show you one simple proof based on this subspace and using these uh, properties of spanning set and so on. And please, uh, if you have leisure over the weekend when once you are able to go back and see there are multiple more abstract properties of subspaces that have been discussed last time which may be relevant for your exam but not relevant for machine learning which i'll not do so you can feel free to go and check those videos out as well so with that i'll stop today's recording and i'll take questions after i stop it